Hello everyone, welcome to How to Read Chinese Poetry video number 7. And to those who join us on podcast platforms, How to Read Chinese Poetry podcast, episode 41. Today, our guest host, Professor Stalling, will invite our listeners to become zhi yin, meaning those who understand the tone themselves. He will take us step by step through the process of composing a regulated quatrain, or jue ju in English. He will also show how tonal prosody, semantic rhythm, and parallelism discussed in previous episodes work together to create distinctive ways of reciting and chanting regulated words in both modern Chinese and English. Let us warmly welcome Professor Stalling. So we're going to start the second episode actually on the rail because this episode begins with the idea of transit, of moving something from one place to another. The word translation actually refers to the transmission or the transfer of a bishop from one diocese to another. And in this sense, it is meant to convey the notion of moving something across space. Of course, translation means to move it across language. And throughout the podcast, we've heard a number of different uh, episodes that would end with or incorporate translations into how we approach the subject of classical Chinese poetry. But it's important to recognize that actually translation comes quite late in the story of classical Chinese poetry and poetic forms. It's not only a latecomer, it's also something of an outlier. It would be incorrect to think that Sino-Vietnamese poets, Sino-Korean poets, or Sino-Japanese poets who all compose and read and consume and socialize through classical Chinese poetry and poetic forms were translating. Instead, the entire information system of these languages built a similar subroutine within the language, right? So spoken language is that recombinatory fluid idiom through which we express our ideas. Classical Chinese poetry is a subroutine within that, uh, that larger information system that is more regulated, right? And each of these various, like these three different languages, all constructed a similar system within which they would be able to participate in the imagined community of the jirin, of, the, of, the, uh, of those who understand that kind of transcendental sound system that we discussed in the previous episode. So imagine for a moment that classical Chinese poetry, in order to move across the hundreds of Chinese languages, dialects, and accents, already are doing something that we would, we could think of as a kind of transmission, right? But rather than moving bits of information that translation does, right, the content of words, from one language to another, from the source to the target, we're talking about moving terabytes of information, information that encode the cosmos and the human relationship to it, notions of balance and harmony that structure and organize that relationship into, into something that provides humans greater agency in a world of indeterminacy and unpredictable outcomes like a Chinese doctor that would bring balance and harmony to the ecology of a human body, the poet does the same in the substrate of consciousness, in the code of language. This system, therefore, can move from one language to another by reorganizing the language as a whole, to make a language compatible with Sino-poetic forms. And that's what we're going to do today. We're rather lucky as English speakers, maybe extraordinarily lucky, because our language 
includes something like seven to eight thousand single syllable or monosyllable words. And as Tai Zhongqi himself has argued in a number of various articles, the root of classical Chinese poetic organization or information system lies not in the Chinese character, but in its, uh, in its syllable form. You see, Wen Yan, of course, classical Chinese as a written language is a monosyllabic modular interlocking system. And only in this system is it possible to create the parallelism that we find semantically and acoustically through the prosody of the Pingzo system. So I'm excited to go ahead and get started and we'll approach the subject of classical Chinese poetry and the movement or the transmission, the translatio of meaning, not in the bits from one poem to another through translation, but by moving an entire ecosystem, an information system from classical Chinese poetics into the Sino-English or the single syllable English system of English Juju. So let's go ahead and get started. So I'm here in the UK on a one week lecture tour. So I'm giving to workshops at a variety of universities and high schools and middle schools throughout the UK. And in each case, the workshops begin by taking the poets and students outdoors into nature. And on these hikes, we collect words. We explained that we have to use monosyllabic vocabulary, but we, in order to gather the seeds of that vocabulary, we want to actually gather actual elements from nature. And in this moment, we will gather things like leaves and grass and moss and bark and sticks, and we'll fill small books called seed books that we make in the workshop together. In these books, we write down the words associated with those elements. So we sprout the seeds, if you will, by adding adjectives to our nouns, dry leaves, gold leaves, right, and so on. And then we think about how those seeds resonate with our feelings in the moment. And we try to gather the larger ecological context of the seeds, right? So what time of day is it? What time of year is it? Uh, what is the weather like? Where is the sun? How are we feeling? You know, and so if, you know, in this case, we're walking in, uh, in a graveyard, we think about the nature of time, but there's geological time in the stones, there's human time in the graves, and then there's natural time of the trees and seasons. And so Dreju can contemplate this relationship of the human experience within the wider context of the natural world. And we think about how, again, to sprout those seeds into two-word units or three-word units, and then how to bring these and organize them into lines, and then lines into couplets, and couplets finally into the Jueju form. But this all begins by starting with the seeds, with the words themselves, discovering the words around us. There are 7,500 monosyllabic English words. It's a huge vocabulary, but we don't want this to be mechanical. We want it to be authentic, a real experience that you've had out in nature, understanding the relationship of Jing and Qing, of nature and human experience. So I also talk about the rhyming system we discussed in the previous episode, right? The ping and zi system of the rhyme tables and how a word must be ping in order to be rhyming with another ping word or zi for another zi word, right? How to build an end rhyme system. What rhymes with crows, flows, sows, right? And then there's semantic rhymes, all those tong lei, those categories of meaning resonance, such as bright belonging to many different nested categories. Right? And then there's grammatical resonance, or the grammatical rhyme, where a single word can be a noun, a verb, right? or even an adjective, like the word spring that we discussed in the previous episode. So now that we have these basic words and the understanding of the different layers of rhyming, we can build a poem together. So we're going back to London. So I'm here outside Soaz. I've just visited a friend. I thought this would be a good place to go ahead and write our first two lines of a Jueju. So to do that, we have to focus on the introduction line and the deepening line. 
both of these have to be focused on natural images. So we're going to take a moment, we're going to look around the space outside Soaz and find some of the words that we can now tune and bring them into harmony with one another through the process of Dui Zhang, of parallelism. And then of course we'll have to, back in our studio, think about their tones and or ping and zi vowel patterns so that we can incorporate them into the proper form. Okay, so I'm just simply going to tilt the camera down so that all of you at home are able to just kind of get a sense of the words that we could choose to compose our first two lines of a regulated jue jiu. You see, the first line has to introduce nature. It has to be filled with natural images. So we have quite a lot here to choose from. We have different leaves like the dry and crisp dead leaf. There are beautiful golden leaves of different sizes. There are plenty of moist and green leaves that are still very much alive, though already fallen. And then beyond the leaves we have grass. And grass is quite interesting because it's so dynamic. It's, it's really a way of catching the dynamic quality of the wind or the breeze. And so that, just as this, uh, this frond of a, of a fern also gives us um, a little bit more of a dynamic image that can be sensitive to, to the breeze, it could convey a, the emotion of resilience or it could convey one of passivity and yielding, right? So the point here is to collect the words first. We're going to take these back into my studio and we will build uh, Dui Zhang out of them, parallel or anti-parallel couplet. And we'll, we'll think about the words and the sound and learn how to balance them in terms of their ping and zi qualities. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a seed book here and, and I'll collect the uh, collect these words. Often I'll, I'll create notes when I collect the, the, um, the seeds just to remind myself where, where I was when I collected the word, what time of day, what time of year, so I have the greater ecological context within which the word appears. With this I'll be able to reconstruct my memory very precisely so that my Jue Jue, even if I write it in a studio, even if I'm undergoing a kind of kuyin, this kind of bitter turning over and over again the words until I finally get them right, get them in the right order, that can be a somewhat mechanical process. But my memory will come from an authentic experience in nature. This is the part that I suppose is most connected with spontaneity. Finding my resonance with the natural world in the real moment of gathering my words. So. We'll, We'll add them to a seed book, and I'll make the notes in a minute. So I'm actually back at home, and I've been here for a number of weeks now, and the memories that were so clear and so vivid in London that day have actually become considerably fuzzier now. But it's it's all there in my seed book. So as I as I go back to those items, those seeds that we collected together outside SOAS, and for those of you who don't know, SOAS stands for the School of Oriental and African Studies. It's one of the great Chinese language programs in the world, and I was visiting a friend who works in Chinese poetry, and it was the first day of term, so all those students were for the first time back on campus, or maybe visiting campus for the very first time, and so the atmosphere was electric, uh, full of life, full of vitality, cool and crisp um, in terms of the weather. Uh, and of course, the, the leaves are starting to fall. But at the same time, it's kind of like the spring for the academic year, right? Because it's the beginning of the academic year. And so this kind of juxtaposition of, of the turning, you know, the turning down of the year toward winter and the turning up of the, you know, in terms of the intellectual life of the college campus was something I really wanted to... Um, to think about for writing this Jueju today. And so I, I took a number of notes. I actually stayed on the campus for a while after I shot that video and collected a few more seeds. And, um, and so I have them all here. So as I open up my, my book, my seed book, uh, I'm able to, you know, to grab the, 
the, the small packets of, of seeds that I collected. And, and as I look at these, you know, it's, it's pretty remarkable because, you know, just looking at the video, you know, knowing that this is the exact same leaf that I picked up there. My notes here, as you can see, um, you know, is just taking a couple of words, you know, it's a bronze leaf. Um, I, I could have called it a dry leaf or a dead leaf. We'll talk a little bit about those choices here in a minute. Um, of course, leaf and leaves. One of the great things about that word is if you need it in a uh, zu position, you can use the singular leaf. It ends with an unvoiced consonant, so it becomes a zu word. If you need it to be a, in a ping position, it can be a plural word, leaves, mm -hmm. because the V is voiced, and therefore it elongates the vowel, creating the ping sound, right? Um, and so uh, then I also mentioned, you know, where I was, right? So as London, September 30th, 2022, it was 4 p.m. and there was a cool wind, right? So those those are going to be key ingredients to build this poem that you and I are going to write right now. So as I mentioned a number of times throughout the video, it's essential for us to maintain the the importance of ziren, of, of naturalness inside our compositional practice. That's why being out and walking in nature and gathering the words there and being authentic to those words and not just pulling them from the ether, but, but making sure that they, you know, that they really come from our lived experience is an important part of maintaining the integrity of the poem. But here we are in our studio, and, and in reality, you know, it's, all about, it's all about this process of cooing, right, of, of bitter chanting. And we're going to do that t together right now. So let's go ahead and, and um, recall for a moment uh, the, the larger context of that day. So I'm going to start by addressing something I mentioned in the video, which is the cool wind. The wind was so brisk and so invigorating that I, I knew almost immediately that it was going to be an important part of the, of the story, partly because it also encodes that time of year. Um, and so we'll start with the, with the word cool. All right, so here we are, cool wind. Now, cool wind, that is a ping word and another ping word. So I know right now that my poem is going to be a ping start. Now, I prefer to compose my jueju mostly, like 75% of the time, in the qi jue form, which is the seven-word form. I like this because it gives me more to work with in the poem. Um, once you're writing a number of jueju, you realize how radically different the wu jue and the qi jue are from one another. It's a completely different species. Those two extra words per line do so much to liberate you and to expand the horizon of possibilities of the poem. So that is my first unit, a two-word unit. It is an adjective, right, and a noun. Now, we could move horizontally across and say what is next after the cool wind, but instead, I want to move vertically to the second line. In the second line, I need to create a parallel unit, right, the dui zhang. So I have to think about this in a number of different ways. And the first is to think about the fact that it has to be the opposite of the ping ping. So if the top one is ping ping, the bottom one will be the reverse, counterbalanced. Ping ping and then zi zi. Next, I need to think about this word as being semantically a rhyming unit. So I want to think about the same category of resonance, the tong lei semantically, the meaning of the word. So if I have cool wind here, I'm going to say brisk dusk here. Why? Because brisk gust and cool wind are almost synonyms, right? They're definitely parallel. They're adjective nouns, so it's also rhyming in the grammar rhyme scheme, same sequence of parts of speech. But brisk elaborates on my emotional resonance, and I'll explain this in a little while when we try a, a variety of other adjectives, but brisk suggests that I am invigorated by this cool wind. And so, believe it or not, that's actually starting already into my third line, which is the line around the human feeling. That brisk is not personification, but it does suggest a human relationship to the cold wind. So brisk gust, those are zi zi, I feel really good about this. I have a, a very nice first uh, unit for line one and line two. Now, let's go back to line one. 
we now have to reverse the ping ping again to zi zi. So it starts with two pings, now it needs to move to two zi's. And so I actually want to pan out here for a moment and think about the time of day. And so here the sun is essential. So the sun is, it's a little later in the day, it's about four, so it's a soft, not a harsh, not a hot, not even particularly warm, truth be told. So I'm going to I'm going to need a word like soft. It's a kind of soft sun. But I can't use sun here, can I? Because that is a ping word. Starts or uh, ends with the in sound, which is a voiced consonant, right? N. So the nasals are ping endings in both Middle Chinese and in English. So well, I guess we need to think of another word, um, and we can use the word light. All right, so here we go, light. So we have soft, light. Now, I want to go down here. I'm going to do the same thing I did before, maybe a little bit more than I might normally do to show this strong semantic resonance. I'm going to now use the word sun and rays. Now, here's the thing. Sun is a noun. But in this context, it's actually an adjective because it is modifying rays. And so soft light, adjective noun, sun rays is also adjective noun. And they are resonant in their category of sky, right, of celestial category. And the soft um, and the sun, you know, soft light, sun rays, it definitely feels like this is a rhyming set in terms of the meaning. Okay, so that means we have zuzu on top and we have ping ping on bottom. Now let's go to the next one. Now, the three-word unit can have a whole ver wide variety of different combinations. It could be an adjective, a noun, and a verb. It could be a preposition, an adjective, and a noun. It could be, uh, you know, a a, uh, a noun, a verb, and an adverb. So, as Tai Zhong Chi talks about in previous episodes of the podcast, there the thir the three-word unit is a prosodic unit. It's a, a metrical unit. This is partly how we recite the poem by creating that two structure, two structure, three structure. But the three is in, a, in and of itself a two plus one structure. Um, so that could mean, for instance, an adjective noun unit had, does a verb, and that's like a two plus one structure. So I'm going to uh, use a verb preposition noun structure. So I want my soft light to pass through leaves. All right, so in this case, the pass, that's a zi, and I need a zi ping ping uh, unit here because I'm rhyming my first line and I'm starting with the ping sound at the beginning of the line. And therefore, I now know what every unit or what every position on the game board needs to be in terms of the ping zi. That's really cool. So I know now that because I'm going to rhyme my first line, which I typically do in English because it helps people, I think, better understand the structure of the jueju. I've got my first line now, and now I need to get my second line, third unit. Zi ping ping on top, it now needs to be zi zi ping on the bottom. Because again, this is a rhyming couplet, so both of the lines end in a ping rhyme, and so that will require this particular ping zi pattern. So it's zi zi ping. So I now need to think about my other rhyming categories, right? So I have pass through leaves. I need that same verb, preposition, noun structure. So I'm going to say glance off eaves. Now I want to emphasize that this setting is both a university setting. So there's buildings here. Um, and yet I need to also address the fact that I have two primary uh, uh, kind of characters in this first line, right? Um, I have the wind and I have the sun. And so this word glance is lovely because pass emphasizes the wind, glance emphasizes the, the angularity of a sun ray or beam. And so I'm, I'm, really quite, I'm really quite happy with this actually. So now let's take a step back. We have our first couplet. This couplet um, has now accomplished the work of our final schematic level, the final rhyming level, which is the work of rhyming couplet to couplet. And this is the cosmological rhyme between nature 
and the human experience. So this is meant to be an interresonant, Duizhang parallel or antithetical couplet with nature images revealing the interresonant, that Gan Ying relationship between the units of nature itself. Our job now will be to take that first couplet and blend it, rhyme it with a human experience. And so, um, so to do this, we can think about the Jueju in terms of its four thematic categories or thematic uh, constraints around the lines. The first one, Xi, means to introduce nature. Then Cheng means to deepen it, usually through parallelism in this case, and or antithetical parallelism, right? That's our first one. Then Zhuan, turn the poem toward the human experience. And then He, which will be to unify the poem. Or, in a more Buddhist non-dual sense, to reveal the pre-existing unity, that, that the fact that the poem has already been written, the poet merely discovers the unity that undergirds the, the non-binary, the non-dichotomy between the human world and the natural world. But we'll get there later. Okay, so let's do it. We're now entering our third line. Now the third line can be a little bit tricky. There's a saying in Chinese poetry, shi yan zhi, the poetry expresses the thoughts and ideas and the mind, the heart. This is important because a poem needs to say something in the end of the day. And the third line is where that work starts. In a sense, this is the one line where your idea, like why are you writing the poem, what is its, what is its purpose, really starts to crystallize. Now, as I go back through my seed books and I, I, I return to the, to the scene, to the jing, to that scene, I know, I know what I want to talk about. I want to talk about that juxtaposition of the, the year turning toward fall and winter, you know, the leaves moving through their life cycle, about aging and time, juxtaposed with the vitality and exuberance of the students returning to campus, right? Springtime on campus, fall in the natural world. And so that's what I'm going to concentrate on. Try to pull that juxtaposition out in my poem. So I'm going to focus on these students. And maybe I'll think about my friend. Uh, you know, we were talking and even, even a little bit fantasizing about, you know, what are we going to do in retirement, right? So we're, we're, we're thinking about the next part, next stages of our lives. At the same time, the students are coming into the building and thinking about the next stage of theirs. And so that's where I want to focus. So I need to mirror, in terms of the pinza structure, I need to mirror that second line in the first two units of the third line. So that's one constraint, but I no longer have to worry about parallelism here. Okay, so those, those constraints, the meaning rhyme is gone, the grammar rhyme is gone. That, that means I'm much more free to write a sentence here. Okay, so let's get started. So I'm going to say, like us, right? That's zuzu, like us. They come, ping ping, like us, they come. Now I need to flip the, the third unit here. So what is zi zi ping on the top now becomes ping zi zi for this next three word unit. It needs to not rhyme in the third word. This is the counter rhyme. It needs to be zi as well, it can't be ping. So it's going to be ping zi zi. So I'm gonna write on, that's ping, on, this the path the like us they come on this path they are our students they are the students coming to learn chinese trying to learn about poetry trying to learn about literature about philosophy right they're they're coming to to expand the horizon to to try to become literate in a in a wider sense of the world right that's that's like us and so that's where we are now. That is Zhuan, the turning line. This is definitely a line that's all about my experience, about being a human being. I'm now very much turned to the concerns of human beings, a human realm. Now I need to end the poem with the He. The Yuan He line is the unity line to unify this human experience with that natural world. So what is it? How can I do, you know, how can I bring the poem to its conclusion? So, let me just read it again. Like us, they come on this path. 
Now, because these can be more sentence-like, I'm going to continue with that thought and wrap it up. I need ping ping, zi zi, zi ping ping. So I'm going to write to find that which each poem weaves, right? So these students are coming to learn the work of literary criticism, of, of poetics, of they're going to open the seeds of the poems. And so that's that's the path I'm talking about, the path of poetry, right? Jeju Da, the path of classical Chinese poetry. So like us, they come on this path to find that which each poem weaves. All right, I'm satisfied. The poem now has brought together the juxtaposition of new and old in the first couplet within the dynamic interresonance of nature. And then in the second couplet, a similar juxtaposition between they, the students, and us, the teachers, right? The interresonant relationship of time and growth aspiration and wisdom of a of a shared path but it, it being at different points in the continuum i'm really happy with this poem and so there it is that's the process of writing a regulated juju in this case a ping start seven word rhyming first line juju okay so now we're here at the end of our journey from queen to yin song now, yin song refers to one of the two methods of chanting regulated verse. Uh, you, of course, this is true of unregulated as well, but it's specifically designed for regulated for reasons that I'll explain. Now, kuyin, of course, means to, 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 to really eat the bitter, to just work hard at the recombinatory, interlocking, modular design system of regulated verse, right? We've, we, we, we tried that by try this word, try that word, until all the levels of rhyming are balanced and counterbalanced in the most beautiful possible fashion. That process pays off in yin song to chant with a melody because you can actually hear all of those rules. They will be self-evident in the presentation, in the aesthetic experience of yin song. But it's a bit more than that. Yin Song is the place. This is where the interresonance of the poem enters into an interresonance between you and me, between us as human beings. The resonance will start with me. I will be the, the stimulus, the gan, and you will have the yin here. I will, in my resonance chambers, right, as a human body, or basically chambers for resonance, and I will make these sounds. And literally, the, your, you know, the, the eardrums will vibrate in, in, your, in your body. You will feel and you will respond to these poems. And as such, we will have this bond, this interresonant connection. That, I think, is really the fabric of the jirin as well. The sociality of poetry culture is one where we share the poems out loud. And... They're especially fun to do, you know, when you're with your friends at, a, you know, at dinner, uh, maybe a little bit of baijiu, something like that. You're feeling really good. You're, you're thinking about the time of year, the experience that you just had, and you can pull one of these poems from memory. Or you could perhaps produce a poem uh, for the occasion and chant it as a part of that occasion. And it's just a really wonderful tradition that is existed for you know 1500 years and well into the present and and will be long into the future so let's just take a quick look at the rules of yin song so yin song has the same rule that composing juju in the regulated forms has or lu shi the longer double juju and that is that you don't have to worry about the first third or fifth column these columns are de-emphasized in the chanting of the poem just as they are de-emphasized in the composition of the poem in terms of their ping or zi quality let me say that in a more simple way these are open positions on your game board guys that first column the first word of the line the third word of the line and the fifth word of the line they don't have to be ping or zi they are open positions and so 
you can choose either one, which makes writing regulated verse a lot simpler than you might have thought from the first part of this lecture. The queen, in other words, is a little less cool, less bitter. Now, when you're chanting them, these words are de-emphasized in this sense. A zhe word is angular, sharp, short, but the zhe word on the first, third, and fifth position are less angular, sharp, and short than the ones in the second, fourth, and sixth positions, as well as the final position of the third line, which is also in the zhe position, and that one is the most angular of them all. And you'll hear that when we chant the poem. Now, the the other rule here is, of course, ping. So the ping words in the second, fourth, sixth positions are extra long, right? attenuated even more, but not as much as the ping rhyme. And you just want to make that one as long as your breath can hold, basically. Just pull it out, open it up to its full sonorant potential. All right, so let's go ahead with those in mind. Chant the poem. I'll stop after the first line and explain it, and then we'll do the whole thing again. This poem is by Li Bai. It is in the same genre as the one we just wrote. It is a ping start, seven word, rhyming first line, jue jue. And the melody for this poem I learned from Parker Huang, a, uh, a Yale professor who passed away uh, some time ago. And I received some recordings that he had done of his yin song practice as a grad student and memorized them for many years. So here's the poem. Zhao ci bai di Cai yun jian. Okay, let's take a look at that. Zhao long, it's ping. Zhao ci. Ci is longer. That's the emphasized. That's the extra ping word. So ping, extra ping. Bai di. <laughs> bai, short. But not as short as di. That one's like really zi. More angular, sharper. The next one also zi. Tai Yun nice and long. Jian really long, as long as I can pull it. Right? Okay, so let's now try it one more time. Chao Tsu Bai Di Tai Yun Jian Jian Li Jiang Ling Yi Ri Huan Liang an yuan shang ti bu zhu qing zhou yi guo wa chou hong shan There it is. That's yin song. Rough translation. We leave the city of Bai Di at dawn under multicolored clouds. The journey to the city of Jiangling is a thousand li, but we'll make it in a single day. From both sides of the river, the apes cry without end. And yet from our small boat, we've already passed 10,000 mountains. Melancholy a bit, but also buoyant, right? Time is long, time is short. These paradoxes are embedded the poem is resonant on all five levels. It's a gorgeous poem, which is why, you know, hundreds of millions of people have read and loved the poem over, you know, over a thousand plus years. It's, of course, uh, an impossible target to hit, but we've made one of our own. It follows the same pattern, and so I'd like to now chant that poem so we can hear it. Cool wind, soft lights pass through leaves. All right, let's just take a look at that first one, right? Cool is long, but wind is longer. Soft is short, but lights is shorter. Pass is short, but not too short. Through is really long, but not as long as leaves, because that's our rhyming word. We're going to apply that same pattern all the way throughout. Let's hear it. Cool wind, soft lights, pass through leaves. Brisk gust, sun rays glance off 
ease. Like us, they come on this path to find that which each poem we. There it is, you guys. That is the journey from Ku Yin to Yin Song. I very much enjoyed our two podcasts. Next year, sometime in spring, I will launch an online course. It's called Zhui Zhu Dao. That course will expand upon these episodes. It's a four-week, pretty deep course where we build books, handmade books, and we learn to gather seeds and sprout them into the two- and three-word units to to organize the seeds according to the four and then five layers of rhyming, and then plant those seeds into Zhuiju, into regulated and unregulated Zhuiju, and Lu Shi, the double Zhuiju form. That class uh, will be available soon, and you can check back on this podcast channel and others to find more about it. I'll leave you with just a little bit of the trailer from that class, but before that, please check out the Newman Prize for English Zhuiju held in odd number of years alongside the Newman Prize for Chinese Literature at the University of Oklahoma, and submit a Zhuiju of your own to the competition this coming spring, 2023, at Newman Poetry Award at ou.edu. The submission deadline is February 15th. If you're interested, I highly recommend watching earlier Newman Prize for English Zhuiju ceremonies, which you can find on YouTube. I've really enjoyed our two episodes together, just as I've enjoyed listening to all the previous episodes of the podcast, and I'm very much looking forward to the ones that follow this one. So thank you again to Tai Zhong Qi uh, and to his entire team, and I look forward to hopefully finding you um, out collecting seeds and making poetry sometime in the future, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Zhuiju is not easy in the sense that there are many rules that we have to follow. In fact, it's so complex that it was the lodestone of the imperial examination system. Hello, my name is Jonathan Stalling, and I'm the creator of the English Zhuiju. It is a new genre of English poetry, but it's a very old genre of world poetry. Perhaps you've heard of haiku. This is the form that inspired that one. It's more than that, though. English Zhuiju is a way of life. That's why this course is called Zhuiju Da, or Zhuiju Path. This will give us a moment, hopefully a lot of moments, to spend together, to go out into nature, to pull in what we've not yet noticed, not only about what's out there, but also what's in here, and how they are interresonant. We'll do this by building sequential skills. You're going to end this class with a book of books. The first class, in fact, is how to make books, handmade books in the Chinese traditional um, style. The book of books will have book one, the book of nature. It will have book two, the book of mind. Book three, the book of rhyme. And book four, the book of unity. Each of these books will be broken into four sections. Gathering seeds, the gathering of the words, sprouting the seeds, drawing more words in, organizing them into parallelism and antithetical couplets that resonate with the cosmological principles of classical Chinese poetry. Finally, planting the seeds into couplets, couplets into jue jiu. And of course, regulated and unregulated verse. Some of these will have less rules than others. But when you have the final jue jiu, your final regulated verse, it will also allow you to enter into a community of Zhuiju that spans the globe and participate in a project, a human project, that is ultimately geared toward becoming self-aware, responsible, and responsive to the world around us. In this sense, Zhuiju has three levels. Zhui means to awaken and to feel. Zhui de de Zhui in Chinese. Zhui ding means to make choices to discern, to learn how to see things 
as interresonant qualities and how to make choices about how we order those into a harmony that will last through time and restore us to that early and resilient understanding that we are a part of the world. And that's where we finish with third level Dreju, dre which means to distill. To distill all of the system of interresonance and poetics and philosophy. We'll talk about Buddhism, we'll talk about Taoism, we'll talk about Confucianism and its teachings and how they're all encoded in one short poem of four lines with five or seven words each. That simplicity helps us navigate the complexity of the cosmos. It is complex and Dreju is complex, but it is not complicated. In fact, it is the antidote to complication because it is what allows us to live within as an interresonant part of the complexity, in fact, of the world around us and within us. We'll talk about non-duality, sound, history, we'll make things together, we'll share poetry, there's workshops here, you'll meet some of my students, and at the end of the day, you're going to come out with your own work, and I'm very much looking forward to reading it. Let us thank Professor Stalling for teaching us the art of composing regulated quatrain in English. Next week, moving from musical speech to instrument music, we will listen to our guest host, Dr. Andrew Merritt, playing his songs of American country and folk music. He will talk about the inspiration he drew from the Tang poetry when composing these songs. Let's meet on YouTube and Bilibili next week.